Squeeze on over to freedomslips.com. Yes, that's www.freedomslips.com. Click the banner on the homepage for the EMP proof bullet drive to get the full scoop of everything that we offer. So, folks, keep your data safe for your peace of mind. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us, we're already here. This is the people's war. It is our war. We are the fighters. Fight it then. Fight it with all that is in us. And may God defend the right. Warning, warning. We gotta stop them. They're gonna kill us all. See how the trouble you've started? Be they a government, be they industry, be they organized labor, be they anyone, or human beings. When the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart. But you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to win the day to the people who run it, to the people who own it. That unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Revolution Radio of FreedomSlips.com, the number one listener-supported talk radio station, throwing ourselves upon the gears of the machine. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. You called down the thunder, well now you got it. Right. You tell them I'm coming, and hell's coming with me, you hear? Hell's coming with me! Revolution Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? I've just been handed an urgent news story, and I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. On the go? Still want to listen? Don't have one of those fancy phones with too many buttons. Don't know what an app is? Or you don't even care? Well, we got you here at Revolution Radio. Now you can dial in 24-7 to listen to our shows. We have a number for Studio A and Studio B. And best of all, it's free. Don't forget, your carrier charges for your cell phone provider may apply, though. So check with your cell provider to make sure. So ready? Here you go. Get a pen. Here's the number. Studio A is 712-432-6958. And Studio B is 716-748-0112. Thank you very much for listening to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, the number one listener-supported radio station in the world. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host... Hi, Christine John Hart. It's the Christine John Hart show coming live from London, and it's Thursday. It's rather freezing in London. I'm going to talk tonight about stupid schools, children, and problems at the school gate. So I'm just been covering school gate mothers and the bitch fest and the problems that you can experience there. And the good time, so I'm going to give a positive hint as well. Um, if you are someone who has a child just about to start school, this is the idea for you. Or you have a child at primary school, because I think the school date uh, is just really about primary schools. When you try to in secondary school, then you don't really have the same problem. And I'm just going to go there. Uh, the UK and London, but I think probably in other countries, we do have a kind of class system and snobbery to deal with as well in the UK. So I hope it's relevant to other countries and I hope you can get something out of it. Um, first of all, I'm going to share about my experience at the school gate. That began, um, I gave birth to a son called Upper Charles in 2000. And three, 
and I worked as a journalist for the Sun and journalist slash investigator for the Sun um, at the time and I'd worked um, for them since 2002 and before that I worked for the News of the World so I was actually became a single mother I was through choice um, I was in love with the um, mother of my son and I met him in Northern Ireland when I was working at the <laughs> for the Sunday Times um, so I just moved in well, then um, I moved to the Sunday Times <laughs> for Liam Clark and um, I met him and we went out for a while and then I had to return here to uh, buy a house and so really split up with him and during that time I had wrote and published a book so there was um, a bit of bad feeling there so that um, that didn't cut so I found myself in a position of being a career woman with a child still still working and you know I own my own property and um, I didn't have to work much and I had a good income so I didn't have problem with low self-esteem and I bought my house in a working class neighborhood just because I grew up there and I it was a nice house a fairly big house and I was happy there. and then it came time for my little boy to go to school and I suddenly realized that I didn't really want him in I was in two minds would I Took him to the local school that was working class, and he would probably have developed a Cockney accent because even though it's West London, a lot of people that are working class tend to let their children talk with a Cockney accent. And I don't know how this has come about because they did grow up grow up in West London. And actually, when I was younger, the kids from West London did talk with a Cockney accent, uh, even though I didn't. My parents insisted on sounding the end of their words and me sounding the end of my words as well. So I don't know how the Cockney accent came about, but I did notice that everyone around me had the Cockney accent. Perhaps people from East London had moved to West London, I'm not sure. Um, so that went on and I, I didn't like it so much. I didn't like it on other people. It seemed to me that people were putting it on to try to sound cute. Um, I had a friend, Susan, at school who talked like that, like, um, Eliza Doolittle, you know, like that. And she charmed all the teachers and the teachers, um, teachers like Sue, Sue Turner. I hope she, God, I hope she's not listening to this. Um, so Sue Turner was really um, popular. Um, she was my best friend. I actually hated her because she was... Um, you know, like golden hair, golden skin, and really annoying somehow, because everybody liked her, and the teachers liked her, and the other kids liked her. I she has a Cockney accent like that, and but I, I don't know how she got the Cockney accent. Well, she lived in West London too, <laughs> so it was put on, and I suppose ever since um, I was at school, it's irritated me when I hear people with Cockney accents. I think, well, um, have, have you come from East London? And if you haven't come from East London, why have you got Cockney accent? But it's sometimes um, working class people find a lot of identity in talking like that. And uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, with them face. Yeah, you know what I mean? Love. Oh, wink, wink. My son does it actually now, speaking like it myself. It's really irritating. So I thought to myself, there I was in a working class area, and do I let my son? Um, actually speak, speak like that for real with the other kids knocking around the street or do I move him to a better area? So this is when he was about three so I decided to sell my house and I shouldn't have sold my house really it was kind of retarded thing to do so I sold my house for zero profit and I rented and then I, I uh, promptly lost my job with um, Gosh, with the sun. So that was all very um, painful. Um, so I, before that, I'd rented out my house for, for a while and I had moved to a better area. And I didn't send my son to nursery in that more upmarket area, um, which is Chickenham actually. I moved to Chickenham, uh, rented out my house, eventually sold it. I waited to 2008 
just sell my house and um, I went for the recession. That's how crazy I, um, I was when it comes to dealing with money. And so I moved to Dickenham, I'd rented out somewhere um, and I was happy working for the son and I applied to the local schools to send my son and we were accepted by a posh little one. It was just down the road. We were living about two streets away um, from this little school and because I had been invited to, to go to the nursery, but I wanted to spend more time with my son, so I hadn't bothered with the nursery. But when we got to the infant school, all the boys had um, gone to the nursery. So my son was kind of, I noticed, was on the outside of what seemed to me to be quite a tight clique of boys. Um, and I noticed that um, the boys in my son's class were all of quite rich, um, well-to-do parents and quite a lot of career people. There was a woman um, called Fiona and her husband was the editor of The Telegraph. Um, not the main editor, but one of the um, news editors of The Telegraph. And so they were impressive people and a lot of them had really big mansions, but I held my own. I was, okay, I was just renting, but I did own property, you know, in other areas. And I, um, this is before I sold my property ridiculously. So I thought, well, I own property, um, you know, I'm renting here because it's a nicer area, renting out my house and I'm working for the sun. I'm a journalist, I'm a white collar worker. I felt as if I could hold my own amongst them and I didn't feel put out. And so um, I quite enjoyed the school run in a certain, a certain way. It seemed, you know, fairly enjoyable. You bring your son to the gate and say hello to everybody. And I just finished going there and I was about, I would say, a couple of months in and I would meet the other women and we would talk and I suppose I made uh, more special friends with the woman whose husband was a um, journalist. Uh, she was a pretty clever woman and actually our sons um, hit it off and they played together and they became friends and uh so and then i noticed that there was quite a lot of coffee mornings going on and i was invited to the coffee mornings so i went along to the coffee mornings and i did feel kind of odd at the coffee mornings i did feel and the houses were beautiful these women's houses are beautiful i did feel as we were settling down that the conversation seem to be about husbands and they seem to be about things like house furnishings and um, I sort of started to panic because I, I didn't know much about curtains or furnishings or house extensions and of course I didn't have a husband so I couldn't talk about what I was going to cook him that evening and so I started to feel a bit but kind of afraid really because I do panic if I'm with people it's almost as if they had started talking in a different language and I felt really sort of swept out of it on a massive tidal wave and I felt really um, at sea and I felt scared because I thought there must be a way into the com back into the conversation with these um, women what am I doing I was sitting there you know eating cake and I thought what and I thought I know cake um, so I brought the subject back to cake. Um, I, I know cake. I, I, I can eat it. I can make it. And but then as soon as I talked about it, I said to one woman, Patricia, who just made this awesome cake and she's really good. And she seemed to twist that back around to talking about her husband again. And again, I felt quite panicky. And so I left early. I left this particular coffee morning um, in a beautiful big house um, early. A woman called Sharon. Um, I can't remember much about her. She she kind of lisped a little bit, and she had um, a house in Barbados, and she kind of thought like that, house in Barbados. And her son was uh, sorry, her um, 
she had a son, I think, but her daughter was more um, more kind of the child that you'd noticed rather than the son. The son seemed to be like, I don't know, he seemed to fade in the background and she had a really kind of modelly um, daughter called something really, really fancy. And she seemed to be kind of quite unhappy in some kind of spoiled kind of way. Um, and her husband was a filmmaker, I think. And so I left early because I had enjoyed talking to her earlier about cancer. She had cancer and she'd survived cancer and she had a little cut in her neck and I'd said, oh, what happened there? And she said, I had throat cancer and I survived it and I, I found that fascinating. So I was like, oh, tell me all about it. You know, you poor thing. And so she was telling me it was interesting and then the other women arrived and it all got... Um, into talking about furnishings and then I had the panic attack and I had to leave and um, looking back it was probably rude of me to leave um, you know because it was her party it just got going and you know I was like I'm going now and it was probably rude but I didn't think time anything of it because I was too busy um, wanting to get out before I passed out because I do have panic attacks and maybe black out so I thought I've got to get out here um, because they were talking about those house furnishing things. I don't know why it made me have a sort of panic attack. I just thought I was getting sort of sucked into some kind of weird whirlpool or, or something, you know, that um, I didn't have any control over. And um, <clears throat> so I got back to my car and I noticed that I had a ticket um, because I parked. I knew I was parking on the yellow line and I just thought, oh, who cares, you know, I'll just pay the ticket. And... Um, I went in and, you know, when I came back, I did have the ticket and I went off and I felt kind of odd. I did feel odd and I think that probably it might have been the start of the downward spiral, um, which I'm telling, so um, let it be a warning to others, the downward spiral that um, I faced. Really, I think from that moment when I left, that it kind of kicked something off and I noticed a few days later um, the girls were talking and I was there and I noticed a kind of like a bit of a, a distance from me and I started to wonder what it was and I noticed a kind of like cooling towards me and one time when all the women were there kind of in a circle and a lot of the women would wear uh, very kind of frou-frou things like particularly one woman called Patricia um, who was ultra feminine very beautiful a lot of them were, were very beautiful and um patricia was very um elfin um sugary blonde hair and she used to wear these like ballet skirts like pastel ballet skirts with a kind of silky tops with kind of pumps like a uh, pastel shiny pink but not um you know nothing um cheap looking this is like really beautiful stuff i think she came from south africa and her husband worked for Disney. I might be wrong, but I think he was a lawyer for Disney. And um, so they lived in a big house um, just along the road from the school. And they had a rather posh son called Bo. And he had a little blonde bob and quite a feminine face, actually. Um, he eventually went off to private school. In fact, all the boys in my son's class, when... Uh, left that little school they all did a mass exodus to private schools so they're now all at private schools and it was a long time ago that they went off to private schools because our sons back then were um five and so i did notice on that particular occasion there was a crowd of the girls around me and um i noticed a cooling towards me like when i would say something you know it you know, it's almost as if they weren't listening to me. I was almost as if my um, status had kind of notched down, which I picked up on pretty quickly because I'm intelligent and I do pick up on that kind of thing. And I noticed just my hands kind of out, and I was, and I noticed Patricia, her eyes flicked over my um, vacant wedding ring finger, you know, my finger on the left hand, you know, the outside, the sort of, the fact that it didn't have a ring on it. Um, and I noticed her eyes flick over it in a sort of a look as if, almost as if she'd discovered something about me, almost, but, but something that she knew, she, she knew and the others knew, but a sort of a kind of a little glow kind of a thing, almost as if there's a rumor going around about someone who kind of um, has BO, 
and you're kind of standing next to them and you kind of sort of smell it and then your eyes meet someone opposite and you sort of the B.O. Oh, I've just smelled it and then God is it. It was kind of like that kind of a look and I felt a bit sort of Phew. and I thought oh shit and I thought it can't be the fact that I'm not married it can't be um these women can't immediately decide that they don't like me because I'm not married. I thought, surely not. And um, when I was still invited to the parties around that point, and there was a beautiful house, gosh, this house is absolutely stunning. It must have been worth about six million, something like that. It was down a very, very kind of, the house down a particular road in Chickenham are like, whoa. And um, it was a house down that particular road, and it was beautiful. It, it was absolutely stunning. And not only was it stunning, it, it was very classy, but not in an ostentatious way. It was subtly classy and just beautiful. There was something about it that was very, very, very beautiful. And the woman, I think, was German and was incredibly good looking. Much of the husbands at who went to that school, they were really ugly. The wife's beautiful, and the men were like really, really ugly. But this particular husband was good looking. He looked a little bit like um, that comedy actor Steve, Steve something, who was in um, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Steve, I can't remember his name, but um, he, he looked like him, and I quite like it. Anyway, I did get on with the guy, like, I chatted him quite a lot. I did hit it off with the men a bit more than the women actually because the, the men were more interesting to talk to because they used to talk about their jobs so sometimes in the morning I found myself talking to the men and I thought oh, I shouldn't really be doing this they you know, think I'm chatting up the men um, but the men were more interesting um, so I would feel more oh I'll talk to him much anyway I liked this um, woman's husband so um, their house was just completely beautiful and their children the older children were really, really stunning looking, the teenagers. And I remarked to him, I said, wow, your teenage um, children just look like the kind of children that should be hanging out with royalty. And I remember thinking the one that was my son's age wasn't as sort of impressive. Anyway, they had all gone to Kew Green Prep, which is a really, really knobby um, school, private school in the area that Colin Firth's children go to. Um, and I actually did a story, um, a friend told me about um, some massive scandal there, which I eventually wrote about in the Daily Mail, um, which is linked to Conifer. <coughs> um, so what happened, I went to a few of those parties and everything seemed to be okay, apart from I noticed this kind of distancing from me because I hadn't worn a ring. This, this is what I felt and it might not have been true but this is what I picked up on and even though I was invited to the parties I was starting to be treated a bit like kind of curiosity kind of a person and um, so I kind of played up to it um, but I didn't feel really happy about it. I wanted to be one of them obviously. I didn't want to be singled out as somebody different but it seemed like they singled me out as something different and a few of them that had um, events after school or like you know little uh, picnics um, I didn't notice I wasn't actually invited but then I was invited to some I have to say I was invited to um, some and I ended up not going because I was starting to find that thing with women really really stressful and I was starting to feel a little bit rejected by some of them and it started to stress me quite a lot really and I think I started to notice that I had in the past um, not really bothered with women and I'd worked in very male orientated businesses like I had worked as a um, investigator for um, ex-intelligence agencies that was more military and there was just men really yeah, in fact there wasn't, wasn't any women at all because if anybody was playing 
um, a wife role, um, if we were going on to cover, it was always me because it wasn't wasn't any other women actually. Um, and although I did have girlfriends at school, once I left school, um, I hang around I hung around with a girl called Susan for for a while, and then we seemed to part our separate ways. But going out seemed to be all about who we were going to get off with. So going out with women was always about which bar will we go to, which guys will be there, who will we get off with, you want that guy. And it was really orientated towards men. So I never really bothered with the women for women's sake. Um, so it felt weird. It did feel weird mixing with them. And I noticed that they really, really liked each other. And they really, really swapped um, phone numbers and they were going around each other's houses. And there seemed to be a lot of frantic activity around that kind of thing. And I felt left out of that as well because I wasn't really interested in women because I'd only ever seen them as creatures to go to bars with to um, meet men. I wondered why they were interested in each other, um, but they were. And that, I suppose it shocked me in some kind of way. And um, then I started to not go to some of the parties because the whole thing was stressing me, the whole thing of them all getting on with each other, the whole thing of them having things to talk about, like house furnishings that I felt really freaked out about. And I started to find their company stressful. So I backed off from a lot of parties and the hell of a lot of parties. I backed off from them and... Um, and then it got worse, worse because I wasn't going to their parties. I was invited to them, and I suppose they saw it as snubbing. Um, a lot of the time I was working, and I would go to the school pickup. And because I'd been in the story, I couldn't really go to stand in any of those circles because they would be talking about um, quite shallow stuff. And if I I was working on like I don't know a shooting or a murder story for this and it was hard for me to put my head in gear I would be going from like murder which is maybe first gear to talk about um, I don't know pork chops and lamb chops and which is better value and it made I couldn't get down the gears that quick enough and I actually did try to, but it didn't quite work out because then when the woman would turn to me and say, oh, what are you up to? And I would be like maybe working on a sort of murder or something or a shooting or, or something in the sun. And then I would say, oh, I'm just a killing or so. And then they would look at me and then probably during the middle of that, the kids would come out and then their little um, Toby would be standing there and I'd say something like, oh, a murder story. And, you know, they kid would what's the murder, mummy? And they would give me a look as if I was like a serial killer myself. So that didn't work out either. So I would stand away from them and um, then it just got just worse and worse. And sadly, the um, there was a group of boys that had gone to the nursery and the they started to fight with my son and his friend the um editor's um son and it got quite bad actually it got to kind of bundling um them there was about eight of them and there was two um my son and this little friend of his and there were there were fights and this other little kid was a good runner my son wasn't so it ended up being my son versus about eight or nine kids. And he would come home every day and say, Mummy, I had to fight. Mummy, I got hit. Mummy, I got hit. And it was quite a hard time for me. I didn't know what to do. And I went in to see the head. And the first thing she did as I sat down, she said, Elle, do you know, it would be fine if you took your child to another school. Don't think I'll stop you and I was just like whoa I, I couldn't believe it that as soon as I sat down that was the first thing that she said to me and I'm a different person now to what I was then and I just kind of sucked it up and um, now I would say wow you're rude but back then I again didn't have an experience of women and 
I I suppose back then I assumed that they were all really nice. Um, so I didn't know what to to say as a rejoinder. She uh, basically said my son wasn't being bullied. Um, Oh, they're lovely boys and I didn't ever say they weren't lovely boys um, it was just my son had this problem and uh, it went on and it went on and it went on for about six months and it was incredibly painful because I felt I was letting my son down and I felt I wasn't protecting him and I wasn't doing anything and I flailed around um, talking to this one and that one and the, the woman that I probably should have spoke to, a woman called Gail, who was a lawyer and um, probably could have been the one who sorted it out. Um, I she was she wasn't around at that particular at that particular time, and so I flailed around and I would speak to my son's form teacher um, every every single day, really, in the morning when I went in, and I would say please, can you talk to the other boys? Especially there was one boy who was a ringleader, um, I won't say his name, um, I'll call him Tarquin. And Tarquin was the, um, he was a privileged boy, he had a nanny, and um, he was the toughest boy, he was also doing karate. And um, I said, could you um, get Tarquin and my son and sit down together and bang their heads together and sort this out? And she said, yes, I'll do it, I'll do it. And she didn't. And it literally went on for months. I couldn't believe it. Six, seven months. And every day I would say to her, every single day, can you sit the boys down together? My son's very upset. There's more um, friends on his side. And, um, you know, it's not... Um, wow, somebody's ringing my show. It's so weird. Um, and that, um, you know, it's not... Um, it's not working out for me and so sorry it's, wow they've really thrown me out so rude to do that um so yeah it, it 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 got bad and my son was upset and um he was suffering he was suffering and i kind of felt frustrated and did i blame him i, I think i did in a bit of a way i think I think I thought, why don't you be a boy? Why don't you throw a punch? And why don't you fight? And gosh, that's so horrible of me now thinking back. But I didn't, because of my own inability and because I was doing everything I could do, I then turned my frustration onto my son. And, you know, why don't you punch then? And at least if you punch back, then the teachers will see fighting and then they'll do something about that because it will be like a brawl, so you must get back. And um, he didn't want to, and, you know, because he's quite, he's quite peaceful and, you know, he's soft. And I took him to karate, I did it with him. Um, he didn't much like it. I enjoyed it. I'm quite feisty. I like a fight, and I'm so different to him. And I got a big punch bag, and I got it on our Porsche porch, and I was punching it and kicking it and I said this is what you do like that and you know hate like that punch like that and he was like I me mean, I don't want to be like you I don't want to be angry more and um so that was it I kind of gave up and I knew that he didn't have what I had in me to have that kind of um fight and I sent out emails actually and I sent out emails to everyone in the class and I said um, my son's been bullied, I don't know what to do, um, the head won't help and the teacher won't help and um, can anyone help? Anyway, I got um, an email back and it was anonymous <laughs> and it said, why don't you move your school? Why don't you move to another school? Uh, boys will be boys. Um, these are all really nice boys you're talking about. And that's all I got all the time was that these are really nice boys. Don't you accuse those boys of being bullied? And it was so frustrating because I wasn't saying that there was anything wrong with them. I was just saying that they keep fighting with my son and he's just on his own because the other boy ran off. And they were uh, like a, a group and they were tight-knit because they'd gone to nursery and they also went around each other's houses and 
they all had nannies. Mostly they had nannies, and my son didn't have a nanny, just like me. And um, so he was suffering, and, and it um, it went on. It was it was horrible, and. I eventually managed to speak to one of the nannies, um, a Polish nanny, a very pretty girl, uh, I can't remember her name, white blonde hair. And I said, could we, because I sought advice from parent line, I think, and they said, why don't you go meet with the boy, um, Tarquin? Um, so I thought, I ask you. So I said to the um, Polish nanny, um, can we go on a picnic together? And she was like, yeah, yeah, sure. So we went on a picnic to Richmond Park and it was quite interesting because Tarquin and my son seemed to like clash and it seemed to me that, I'm not going to say something when we're talking or anything wrong with my son, but my son was more um, childlike, but you know, they, they were both five and Tarquin was very, incredibly adult and incredibly um, intellectual and and yet feisty and there was kind of a, a, a they were so different it was so striking that they were so different and it was interesting that you know, um, we had beneath uh, palm trees not palm trees uh, weeping willows beside the river um, Tark Queen spent his time having an intellectual conversation with me and I enjoyed chatting to him we chatted over sandwiches and <laughs> the nanny was running around the trees playing with my son, um, who's more like, you know, nerf gun kind of thing. And um, I had quite an enjoyable time and I dropped them off. Um, I did feel that the nanny didn't really take to me. And I think, again, it was my fault because when um, I think the boys did end up walking off and doing something together, and I was left with her under the trees. And I was so stressed out and so exhausted from the whole thing and I'm not great with women and I just I didn't really feel like making conversation with her not because I didn't think she was a girl just because I was just numb with I was tired from the whole thing and I was also holding down a job at the sun at the same time and the school was just literally soaking up um soaking up all my um, addiction really it was just a full-time thing um so so sorry somebody's wrong in again they keep telling me i i can probably tell they're listening to the show and i would really appreciate it if paul stevenson wouldn't keep ringing in to the show how annoying is that um wow <laughs> So rude. So, well, Stevenson, please not ring into my show. You can't pick up a call anywhere if someone's ringing in. And if it's to say maybe I'm not on air properly, I. Wow, so rude. Um, absolutely rude. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> I just, just really, wow. Um, wow, that is so annoying. Sorry, I'm going to have to say something here. Wow, so annoying. Um, wow, <laughs> really, I I can't absolutely believe it. So a co-host of the show is just writing down here, poor mummy who loves the victim role. Oh, she's a single victimised mother. What the hell? Oh, my God. I'm sorry, I can't believe it. Um, Paul Stevenson, can you shut up, please? This is my show. I'm talking for other women four other women who experienced victimness at the school gate. Why is it anything to do with you? Why is it anything to do with you? It's about having difficulties talking to women. Oh my God, some people, absolutely insane. You know, it's so annoying people that listen to your show and they don't like you and they don't like the show and yet they interrupt in like really weird ways. You think if someone didn't like your kind of shows, they wouldn't actually listen to them. I'm sorry about that interruption. Um, so somebody thrown me, and I think I was something that might help other women, um, which what I'm trying to do here, I'm not telling a story for any other um, reason. So um, I have got on with Little Tarquin, 
it, it had gone off, there'd been that little time at the end. Um, as I was saying, I didn't talk to the nanny, and we had some time together under the trees. And I remember thinking, say something, say something, ask her about hope and say something. I just, I, I just couldn't, um, I didn't have it in me. I asked about the family, I did a snooping, which I suppose wasn't really, wasn't really fair, but I just thought, well, I want to find out a bit. And I did find out that the child didn't ever see the, the mum or the dad, that he, you know, he was looked after by her all the time. And she did say that she was going back to Poland and she had looked after him since she, the child was a small baby. And I did think that that, because he knew she was going, I thought that was trauma to him. And I thought, well, maybe that's why he's punching, uh, punching out and being fighty because he's angry and just a fire he so because that really is his mother you know because it is it's like the French child thing and um so I thought oh and I did feel a little bit of bond with Tarkin because I'm adopted and my natural mother um left me and I just thought he's got that pain there and um kind of felt a sort of little bond with him and you know I thought I felt bad that he couldn't get on with my son, but I did understand why, because he was a lot more mature than my son at that particular time. And um, so the next, the days went, and there was a month or so, and it seemed to be okay. And then there was a, my son started um, saying, oh, it's happening again, it's happening again. And gosh, I know it sounds awful, but I kind of tried not to to listen really. I, I kind of said you've got to hit back then. If someone hits you, you've got to hit back. And gosh, it was hard back then. It was really, really hard. And God love my son. He went through that. Um, and I tried to put it out of my head. I was working on a project around then, a big project. And I tried to think it would be it will be okay. And, but every morning I spoke to the teacher and said, Can you speak to him? Can you speak to him? It was just one of the ideas. And then she always said at the end of the day, Oh, sorry, I forgot I'll do it tomorrow. And that went on. And interestingly, after it all transpired, when I had a drink with Tarkin's mother, she said, Who do you blame for all this? I said, oh, I don't really know. Who do you blame for the teacher? The teacher. And I said, Yeah, you're, you're right, because she should have got them down. And together uh, she didn't so it was a very painful because it was my son's first and, and um so so i've been really thrown by someone reading really, it's really hurt my feelings because i'm trying to share something and um, i'm quite angry um but that person won't be in my life actually anymore um so i got to the um point where really have been thrown. Um, I got to the point, it, isn't it a shame that people can win in when you're on air and that they would be so arrogant as to do something like that. Um, so I went to a party, there was a party on in the hall and I got there to see my son and he and this other boy were over one side of the room and all the other boys were partying and jumping around and my son and this other boy were left out of the party. And I felt really, really sad. And I thought, well, this is what he's been telling me has been going on. And I just felt really sad. And I thought, why doesn't the teacher break them up a bit? And why is she allowing this sort of gang situation? They seem like a gang. Um, they were being almost like, I don't know, like boys when they go out on a night out, they were just sort of throwing themselves over each other and we're the lads kind of thing that really um, I didn't expect but it was like that and it was like they were like a little gang and I didn't think it was right um, but I suppose the parents whose children were in that little gang thought it was probably awesome that they'd all bonded so seeing it from their point of view but I mean I saw it as something bad they probably saw it as something good so um, anyway I stood there and I thought this is this is horrible um, it just seemed not right somehow and I felt sad for my son 
and um, sad for the other boy. And then there was another boy as well, just seemingly just standing in the middle of the room on his own, and that that was sad too. I mean, they should be helped. They're going to a school for the first time. They should be helped all mix in. Not, I don't know. I just think this teacher wasn't really doing anything. And um, then Top Quinn came over to my son. He ordered the other boys to hold him um, down. So there's about six or seven holding my son down, and Top Quinn proceeded to beat him up. And I watched in horror, and I was sort of stood rooted, and I couldn't move for a minute. I just like couldn't believe my eyes and then when I eventually could move I was rushing over there and I said stop immediately and it's almost like he was in a dream or a trance um, when he was punching and I thought this is what's been going on and I can't fully believe my son has been going on it's so it seemed like unbelievable in some kind of way but there it was and I was thinking it might be and so I said, don't do that because I'll tell your parents. And he said, I, I don't care about my parents. And I said, well, I'll tell the teacher. And he said, I don't care about the teacher. I said, well, I'll tell the head, the head then. And he burst into tears. The crime didn't last very long, but and it didn't seem very kind of beautiful, but, you know, there we are. Um, so I got my son and I brought him over and I said, I, I want to go, this isn't very nice. And um, we went, and then the next day was the sports day, and I went to the sports thing, and I noticed a few people seemed to be nudging each other when I was there, and eventually I spoke to one of the other mothers and the boys, and she said to me, a lot of people were shocked the way you behaved at that party. I said, how do you mean? It's, and she said, you told off Top Quinn in a very brusque way. So I said, what do you mean brusque way? She said, well, when you speak to your child, you're supposed to crouch down and speak to him softly. And I said, well, he's punching mine and the other's holding him down. And I said, I just wanted him to stop. And um, she said, well, still, you, that's not the way you talk to your child. And loads of people um, said that you shouldn't have talked to him like that. And... Um, yeah, I felt really weird, but I did go and apologise to the woman whose party it was. I said, oh, I'm really sorry if I behaved in any way out of order, but I just wanted it to stop. And um, they still seemed a bit cold to me. And the, which I took, and I thought, well, I've, d I've done that wrong. I shouldn't have done that. And I was looking at myself and my own behaviour and realising that I had you know, spent a lot of time in a male male world, you know, a newsroom at the News of the World, mostly men, and I thought, well, I need to behave like these women behave. So I was trying to get cues from them, and so I thought, well, I'll do what this woman, Gail, this lawyer, um, do what she says. I did admire Gail, actually. Um, so I thought, well, next time I speak to my patch down, and... Um, Anyway, um, it went on and it went on, and this time I thought, well, I'm going to have to just, I've seen it in my own eyes, my sons are not exaggerating, and it, it's not fair to have so many onto one, because there's more in his gang, and um, so it went on and it went on, and I kept speaking to the teacher, and then there was a temporary teacher, and I spoke to her, and I thought, oh great, she will say something, and she kept saying, oh sorry, I forgot. And it, it was heartbreaking, really, and it just went on and on. And one morning, I was driving my son to school, and the sun was shining. It was a really beautiful day. It was so beautiful. And I said to him, I'll have a lovely time. And he said, oh, well, I won't, mummy. I'll just get hit again. I'm tired of being here. It makes me feel sad. And I just thought, oh, I can't take it one more time. And so I got it by the hand, and... I thought I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something that will make um, make a difference. I'm going to speak to the teacher in front of the class, and I went in, and the class um, was sitting down, and I thought, "Oh, fantastic!" And there was no one around. The teacher wasn't there, and no one old Tarquin was sitting right in front of me, sitting in awe. And I remembered all what um, Gail said, so I 
what, what if they get properly crouched down? So I crouched down and I said, Tokwe, and I had uh, my son by the hand, I said, Tokwe, you really mustn't, you really mustn't hit off, it really makes him sad. And Tokwe looked at me, he knew me, um, with big eyes and said, okay then, um, in his way. And I thought, solved. I remember feeling really as if a weight had um, lifted off my shoulders because he was an intelligent child and I believed him when he said okay then I thought yeah <laughs> I've done it and um, I just was about to say goodbye to my son and a little Japanese um, assistant teacher came running in and said are you not allowed to talk to the children and I said oh well I was just trying to sort something out she says no class has started and I'm like well okay I'll go then she goes no you're not going anywhere you're coming to the headmistress's office so I had to follow her. Actually, I shouldn't have done that. I'm a bit of an idiot, but I shouldn't have done I should have just said, no, I'm going. Um, but I didn't. I followed her down to the mistress's office. And it was all very weird. And she... I sat in um, the headmistress's office and the headmistress said, oh, don't worry, you haven't done anything wrong. Forget it, it's okay. And so I left. But as I left, I had a really awful feeling, a really big feeling of dread that I had done something terribly, terribly wrong. Not that I had done something terribly wrong, but just that I had put my foot in it in some kind of way. And um, I rang Parent Line. Um, I found them a fantastic resource. And I rang Parent Line and the first um, woman I spoke to, she said, were you bullied? And I said, yeah, I was bullied at school. I was bullied by my best friend, uh, Margaret, at primary school. And she said, well, it's also, um, you have to think about, sometimes when things happen to your own child, it brings up um, things that have happened to you. And I said, yeah, I suppose it is bringing it up. And she said, as for talking to that child, just forget it. It doesn't matter. You didn't do anything wrong. And so I said, oh, well, that's what Head said. But I just this really really bad nagging feeling and it was like a dread feeling of dread or impending doom um anyway i picked my son up from school and that evening it got to about six o'clock at night and i was just about i think we were going to fish or something like that and the phone rang and it was the head and she said oh by the way you um are banned from the school you are banned from taking your child to school and you need to get your husband to do it. And I said, I'm not married. And she said, well, you need to make other arrangements then, but you are not allowed to set foot on the school playground until I find out what exactly went on. I said, well, you know what went on. And she said, well, you're not allowed to talk to children. And I said, well, everyone talks to them as they come in. She said, well, you burst in the classroom and shouted. I said, no, I didn't burst in the classroom and shouted. Well, how would you possibly shout at a child when they're right in front of you? And why would you do that in front of 30 children? It would be mad. I was trying to achieve a result. And so I had already made the mistake of telling off a child, not shouting. I said, so this time I thought I'd get it right. And she said, well, that's what my teaching assistant said. She came in and caught you. And I said, that's not true. Um, you know it's not true. And she said, well, I need time to work out uh, what really went on. And so you have to stay out by the playground. And I was really, really upset because I thought, how am I going to get my son into school? And actually, it turned out okay because I would take him to the gate and some of the other mothers would see me and take my son on in. Uh, it was quite painful that she had said that and also I knew that I'd done nothing wrong and to make up that I had burst in the classroom, the door was open and you have to go through the classroom to go to the cloakroom. So all the parents went in there every single day, that was what happened. Um, so you didn't need to burst in and as for shouting, who would you possibly do that to witnesses? You just wouldn't. And so. I thought, well, why is she saying that? Why has she come up with that? And really looking back, I can see now she just wanted me to leave. She um, she wanted me to leave, basically, that was it. And presumed that when she would say, you can't bring your child in across the playground, that I would be so embarrassed that I would go. Because um, I'd already said to her about leaving, that's 
obviously I should leave. And she was like, yeah, you should. And so I guess that the planning was, uh, oh, this is so embarrassing. You won't ever put up with it. You really will go this time. And um, she was right. I did. I, I felt humiliated and it felt very unfair. And I was unhappy about it. And at the time I rang a friend of mine, Greg Miskew, who I worked for at the News of the World, and we'd stayed friends, or well, not anymore, but we'd stayed friends, and um, good friends, and I rang him in tears, and I said, this is what's happened, I said, what do I do, I feel really bad, and he said, we turn them over, is what we do, News of the World star, and I was just shocked at the time, and I thought, what? And I wasn't sure whether it was a good idea. He went running off and spoke to the Sunday Mirror. Um, Sunday Mirror rang me and I said, yes, it's true. And um, they said, oh, we're going to run it. And I remember thinking, well, is this a good idea? Um, because the Sunday Mirror is not, you know, it's not, is it that serious? And I'm really offended here by what's happened to me. I've done nothing wrong. And my son suffered for quite a long time. And, you know, I feel that this, head is a little bit corrupt to see something like that and burst in the closet and shout it's a little bit little bit much and um i felt bad and i felt like getting legal help and um suing her or something it was out of order and also i had witnesses and i managed to get one of the mother to i'm oh, sorry one well, i'm going to have a chat with paul stevenson thank you Jim. Sacred Matrix with hosts Janet Kira Lesson and Dr. Sasha Lesson, 6 p.m. Eastern Time here on Revolution Radio. Here we free ourselves from the God spell, transform the perverted matrix to the divine one. We become conscious and we embrace universal unlimited love. We feature colorful guests and topics such as extraterrestrials, ghosts, interdimensionals, and aliens. We examine evidence, anomalies, archaeological ruins, and anthropology. We explore past lives, future lives, life between lives. We get into astral projection, near-death experiences, archetypes, visions, and dreams. Episodes include time travel, teleportation, counseling, spirituality, tantra, relationships, peace, shamanism, peak experiences, and ego transcendence. Join the lessons Saturday, 6 p.m. Eastern Time here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com for the Sacred Matrix, a divine paradigm of love. Take a look around, kid. What do you see? Homes being foreclosed. People working two, three jobs just to put food on the table and still drowning in debt. Don't get me wrong. This country is founded on great ideals and principles. They've all been ruined by the banks. Open your eyes to the banks that are robbing you. You know who my favorite president was? Who? Oh. Thomas Jefferson. Because he saw all of this coming and tried to stop it. He fought the banks. JFK too, and they killed him for it. The banking institution is more dangerous than an army, he said. He also said that every generation needs a revolution, Jimmy. The American dream is just that. Just the dream. War is a continuation of politics. Only by other means. Politics is a continuation of economics by other means. This is our bank. This is our war. 
And this is our plan of attack. Banks have become an essential threat to our democracy. So consider this justice. Thank you for listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com, the number one listener-supported radio station on the internet. Please help support this station so this battle can continue forward. Revolution Radio! Looking for a nightcap to fill your listening needs? Come join us on Spaced Out Radio with me, Dave Scott, right here on Revolution Radio. Monday through Friday for three hours a night, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, we will take you down the supernatural path. From ET contact to the paranormal and all of the spiritual, cryptid, and conspiracy stories in between, you can find us right here on Revolution Radio at spacedoutradio.com, on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, and on Facebook at Spaced Out Radio Show. Spaced Out Radio, it's a night of talk and interaction. Are you experienced? things were not quite right, that everything was just ever so slightly askew. Do you have, to paraphrase Morpheus, a splinter in your mind? If you're interested in hearing the latest information about UFOs, the paranormal, ancient cultures and structures, monatomic elements, longevity, fantastic discoveries in science, download it to your brain, then tune in to us. Hi, I'm Dave. And I'm Mackie. And we are Shiny Side Out, Sundays, 2 to 4 a.m. Eastern. See you then. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. Enjoy your extra big-ass fries. You didn't give me no fries. I got an empty box. Would you like another? Extra big-ass fries. I said I didn't get any. Thank you. Your account has been charged. Your balance is zero. Please what? come back when you can afford oh, to make no, a purchase. No. I'm sorry you're having trouble. Come on. Trouble. I'm, I'm sorry you're having starving. trouble. I'm starving. Thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio. Here at Revolution Radio, we believe in freedom of ideas, freedom of speech, but above all, we believe in freedom of existence through self-reliance. This station is 100% listener-supported, and as a fundraising promotion, I have a kick-ass free gift for a $100 donation. 35,000 seeds. 25 years in the freezer. Long-term storable, 54 different varieties. So if food prices go crazy... The shit hits the fan, or if you just want to save tons of money every year by creating your own food like I do, grab our seed pack special. Just look for the banner on the homepage at freedomslips.com. Don't be a statistic. Don't be part of the problem. Be part of the solution. We need, as humans, to start taking care of ourselves and not depending on the megacorps to provide unhealthy, nasty food. Included in this package is also a DVD with 900 survival and off-grid living documents and the offline home canning how to do everything website all on the DVD. So when you're growing all that food, you know how to can it, store it, preserve it, etc. with all these documents. So thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. I hope that you will pick up this package and start learning to be free. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, where information never sleeps and freedom is one seed that needs to be planted. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host... Oh, 
by Christine Jen Hart back Christine Jen Hart show isn't it amazing how you wake up when somebody's being rude and sending me abusive texts <laughs> it's so funny isn't it oh gosh such um negative attacks I've had all week um uh, but I'm learning how to roll with the punches and who these people are and how actually they don't seem like they're demon possessed they probably are jumping up and down like monkeys um the show actually tonight is i'm sharing for other women who might go through what i'm going through in the hope that they um can find a way to deal with it so i'm going to deal with the positive um antidotes in the second part of the show that's the only reason oh more threats as well oh my goodness it's so pathetic i can't believe it so rude so annoying um I would never, if someone's having a radio show, someone's trying to help other people, um, send threatening texts to that person when they're on air so they lose their train of thought, so they don't um, know what to say, so they're completely thrown, calling names, calling them salt and things, and just absolutely awful. But there we are, that's what I'm having to put up with right now. Um, so um, that is what's going on. Um, there we are. One can think at that point in time, well, at least there's a locked door between me and them. Um, right, as I'm saying, um, gosh, I'm quite angry, really am angry. Um, so that um, went on and it was a difficult time and I can't remember where I actually got to in the story. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So, goodness, you said what you did, and I thought, well, since this is going on, I'm going to write the story. So, I wrote the story up and I gave it to a paper that I'd worked for for quite some time for many years, actually, um, the Daily Mail. And I'd been an investigator for quite a long time, earned a lot of money um, through working for them. And um, <coughs> and I'd written stories for them as well, in between um, being an investigator. So, I was much trusted by them. So, I wrote the story. And it went straight in, and it went straight in or under um, Woman Who Confronts Sons Bully um, is banned. And I didn't want to call um, Tarquin a bully. I didn't want to label him with anything. Um, so I didn't really agree with the headline. I didn't like the headline. Um, but then GMTV rang me up, and I went on GMTV, which I'm going to load onto my Facebook so that will be loaded on so i'm going to call this part one and then i'll call that part two and hopefully you can see there um the second part of the story that um i then went on gmtv with my son and i spoke about it and then what happened next i used to hang around with hugh burnett who um is quite famous he used to work for the bbc's um if you google him he's on wikipedia he's an xmi6 officer um and he is a film producer and he was my best friend for many years and i went around his house and you know said what do i do about everything that's going on i said the um one of the women has come to me gail the head head of the women head girl and she said oh you have to um i had coffee with her in richmond she said you have to you've attacked a whole community by going on gmtv you have to apologize to everybody and say you were in the wrong and um i thought what well, what do you mean in the wrong? How do I, what do I say sorry for? And she said sorry for going to the press. And I said, well, that was Greg, really. It wasn't my first thought. And um, she said, um, also, I felt that it was getting out of control. And I felt there needed to be someone, because the head was very um, in with the um, very, very rich women of the school. She was like their friend. So she was like head girl number two of the sort of posse. And so she couldn't be trusted to tell the story honestly. And I was starting to get worried, um, especially when she made out the shouting thing. So I thought, I'm, I do want um, what Greg said involved. I do want other people um, involved. And um, I do want the public's eyes on it. Because, you know, I mean, what's going on here? It freaked me in a way, you know. And um, so I'd gone in TV and told the story and Australian um, TV company, I think Channel 7 in Australia, also came to interview me and worldwide people were interested in it and a few people were saying online they believed it was a class issue and if I look 
now, I think it actually was a class issue. I think that the head, um, who was very middle class, um, these schools in these middle class areas, they are treated like private schools. And it's almost like the people there have realised that they can save money by children that would normally go to a private school, but using these state schools as private schools. And they have them like a little fiefdom. The, 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 the wives get very involved with them. They become the governors, they become the PTA, they volunteer at the school. And it's almost like it's clicky, it becomes clicky. And if your face doesn't fit, or if you are working class, now I always thought of myself as middle class, but actually I'm not. And, you know, my adopted parents were obviously working class. And people in these areas, normally their parents are middle class. So they have a kind of classiness that you can tell. And they sniffed me out and knew that I wasn't like them. Like a kind of blue stocking thing. And they, you know, wear cashmere and feel comfortable in it. I wear cashmere and I feel, oh, I'm wearing cashmere and I feel quite self-conscious of it. But, um, so it's a different kind of person. It's not upper class, it's not the kind of people you see in the back of Tatler, but it is, um, they're a certain type of Bojan wearing kind of person, and um, they really do run the schools, they have a lot of say in it, and they certainly had control of this head, and so it made me uh, want other people involved, so I did think it was the best thing to do, but then when I had lunch with, uh, no coffee, with Gail, she said you have to apologise, so I say what well, apologize about or well, how do I apologize? Oh, I'm sorry, I went on TV or I'm sorry, but that's what I do because I am a journalist, so it is what I do, it's not out of character for what I do. And um, she said, Oh, you have to say you were completely wrong about the bullying that Tarquin's not a bully and your son's a bully. And it was the first time I'd ever heard her say that, and I thought, What? How could he possibly be? Because he was a victim. Of, and she said, oh, your, your son um, was sitting back. And I said, well, I, I told him to do that. I coached him to do that. And she said, you've got to, um, you've got to say you've got everything wrong and that you're really sorry. Um, so I went to see the head and the head said, you should write down. This is how it's quite interesting. You should write down how you got it wrong. And I nearly went for it. And if it hadn't been for asking Hugh's advice, um, who said, don't put anything in writing there, I'm going to use that for if it happens again, um, to say, oh look, you know, she said it didn't actually happen, so it's quite, it, at the time I remember realising that I was quite naive with the ways of women and how the, the things, you know, I always thought when you're children, keep it, keep it clean, keep it straight, don't manipulate, but there seemed to be a lot of manipulation, a lot of lying and a lot of not minding that children were hurt kind of thing. And Gail said to me, why don't you have a party? And so what do you mean? She said, why don't you have a party for your son? I said, well, how do you mean? And she said, have a party. And I said, um, well, this current climate, nobody would turn up. And she goes, well, quite, nobody would turn up. And she said, your, your son, wouldn't it be a shame if your son was left out of the lovely parties that are coming up and that shocked me and I said well yeah it would be she said well you should apologize or he'll get left out and so I apologized I didn't put in writing I did apologize and um, the head then set up a meeting with this other mother and she came in and sat there and a friend came with me at that point and um, she ripped into me and she said, you told my son off at the party and um, you shouldn't have done that and you shouldn't have gone on TV and I could sue you. And I just let her rip into me because I if I want this over with and I don't want my son to be left out of party. So if she'd have slapped me even though I'd have taken it. And um, then we went off afterwards and had a drink together. She blamed the teacher. I think she had a good point actually there. And I thought it was over, but... Um, then my son was left out of every single party that they had and it was horrible, it was just really horrible, every party, and there was quite a few parties, it was a well-off area, um, he was left out of, um, and it hurt him, he saw it, um, one time a woman called Sharon, the one I mentioned earlier, whose house I'd been around, 
I was parked at a zebra crossing and I was just about to, it was the lights and the lights were red. And all of a sudden I turned and everyone from my son's class were walking down the road, clutching balloons and all like linked in a little kind of snake. And on their way to her house to go to her son's party, except for my son. And I looked around and saw and I thought, what? And I thought, oh no. And he turned and looked and his little face absolutely crumbled. And I should have run the red lights actually, thinking back now I should have done, but um, it was horrible to have to to have to see that. And he left that school, it was only a school that um, deals with I think five to seven. And so all the boys from his class went off to private schools and my son then went up the road to the um, other primary school and it was different boys and my son made friends and but there were a few mothers that didn't forget so he was left out of a few parties and um, eventually then he's a strong personality and he forged friendship and when he went to the secondary school um, it didn't involve mothers at all um, it just it didn't involve some person ringing in the show. Well, it didn't involve um, mothers. It just involved him, and he forged his way. And um, but I did find lately when I moved out of the area, I did find that you know I was harassed a little bit about, well, why don't you get your son uh, into a school in that area? And I said, no, he's staying at that form. They were very pushy to me, like really, really pushy, and it made me and I've had to fight um, to say you know, he's staying there and it did make me feel sad and it did make me think that I want to do a show about how the rich people in certain areas do grab the local state schools now local state schools are really poor uh, people who can't afford private education and I think if you are well off then you should send your kid to private school because you can afford it, and why not, and leave the state schools, the good state schools. But instead of that, there's a lot of grabbing of the good state schools, and it will be done by people that have influence and power, and they will grab it, and they will also make spaces for friends that are coming from out of areas. And this does go on, and if I wasn't such a strong person, I might not have powerful friends to call on when I've been um, attempted to have me pushed out of those areas. And it's interesting. So that was my point, and that was why I was telling the story that, you know, it's interesting. We all want to do well for ourselves. And, you know, as somebody that sits across the barrier of working class and middle class, I don't really know what I am. I know that um, my adoptive parents were. He was a bricklayer. She worked in a factory. They lived in their own house that was left to her by their mother. And it was quite a nice house. So did that make them middle class? I'm not sure. I went to an all-girls grammar school with the daughters of doctors and lawyers. And I would have been an academic, but for my mother's jealousy. And uh, so I didn't. I failed and <coughs> then went to work in various shops before I... Um, got picked up and um, recruited for the ex-intelligence services and then went into working for the newspapers and became a journalist. So I don't know what class I am, but I know when I was there to mix those other women that, uh, well, the same person is trying to ring in again. I'm actually, do you know what? I'm actually going to take the show because it's it's absolutely ridiculous. I can't believe it that same person has intruded on my show and it's completely thrown me and Hawk should have a record of not doing that or get rid of this particular that's doing that because it's totally abusive and I'm trying to give a show and help other women that they not go through what I've gone through and this person is just jumping up and down behaving really insanely and um, I'm not happy about it and I hope Hawk is listening and I hope they get rid of this particular person. Um, so 
yeah, I've been completely thrown. Um, so what I want to say to women out there, um, I basically, I, I thought I was middle class. I thought I want my son to, you know, he could have gone to the working class school. I thought maybe that will make him tougher. Maybe that will be better. But then I didn't want him having a Cockney accent. And that was the main thing that made me think, well, you know, let's move to a better area. When it comes to school time, um, he'll go to a better school. What I didn't really envisage, what I didn't um, anticipate would be that these areas, these better areas, because had I have moved there just as a journalist with no child, I wouldn't have mixed with them. I would have lived there and I've gone into the office and I wouldn't have known about them. But because you have to mix in when you have a child, you have to do the school gate thing, you just see an area and actually that particular area um, is called St Margaret, some make no bones about what it's called. Um, that particular area, actually even when I drive through it now, I feel a sort of sense of a sense of knowing it, a sense of knowing that there's something not good about it and not wholesome. And I think of like wholesome things, I imagine a little village up north and everybody being nice to each other, everybody being kind to each other, nobody judging each other. And it seems like in these other places like St. Margaret's, um, it's all about what you've got and who's got the biggest house and whose husband earns the most. and are you married or are you not married and if you're not married you must be a low kind of woman because I'm married and I feel secure and better and superior we have a big house and I have a strong rich husband and therefore I'm more of a woman than you are you're not you're a fallen woman you're less than me and there's, there's all that that goes on and tinged with the class um our structure and I remember talking to a friend of mine who's a big communist or socialist and I said I don't get it the way they seem to have sussed that I'm not one of them and he said oh, of course you're working class and they have ways of smelling you out that you're not one of them and, and interestingly um, an ex-boyfriend of mine he he's moneyed and he sent his daughter to uh, a private school and he had to leave and he said it's exactly the same thing he said, my wife was really upset by these women and they ostracized her and she's working for us and um you see what happens the only people that get hurt in it uh, it's for the women having to go there every day but who really gets hurt in it is the children because they do do the leaving out of party stuff and um pixie Hopkins seems to think it's okay, but I witnessed it firsthand, having had it done to my son, having seen it done to others, it's quite painful because it's quite vicious, and you know, we all know that, I mean, I went to grammar school in a very upmarket area, and I got in with the wrong crowd, but I got in with Janice, who's now a professor at um, university, but at the time she was punk, at the time um, she stopped me from listening in class, another girl, Debbie Taylor, um, bullied me and um, these were well, well off girls they were very strutting um, rich girls um, perhaps not Janice but certainly Debbie Taylor and I screwed up I got into the wrong company and the wrong company for your child is just someone that doesn't make them listen at school you know distracts them and says it doesn't matter you know so a working class kid isn't really going to um, drag your child down but even at that early age um, these people seem to think it was good Hi, it's Christine Joan Hart, and I seem to, um, I don't know if anybody can hear me, but I don't know if I've been um, cut off air or or not. Um, there seems to be somebody, well, there's another host um, ringing into my show, um, sending me abusive stuff, and 
really just going um, absolutely, absolutely crazy. Um, sorry, I'm trying to compose myself. I have been under a lot of stress this week and it's quite unnecessary um, stress actually. Um, so, yeah, as I was saying, um, I would always thought of myself as middle class, um, but it seems I'm not. So it's difficult. So I just want to, you know, advise people. Um, you might think you're middle class. You might think, oh, I know, I'll go and live in this village, um, you know, or this nice area. I'll send my school, my son, my daughter to that lovely little school over there I've seen. And it might not work out the way you had it planned. Um, a, you can't do it every single because will be, um, your child will be ostracized. So please stick to a working class area if you happen to be a single mother because it just um, it won't work. Um, if you think to yourself, well, I want my son to go to that good school, a really good idea and you might think well I don't want to do that really good idea would be just to go to a jewelers and buy yourself a fake ring uh, buy yourself a fake engagement ring buy yourself a fake wedding ring and talk in the we use the we a we thing is with us and um, you know if you're renting somewhere don't let that slip um, you know you can cover it up and you can make sure your son isn't left out and it can work that way but if you're going to go about it in an honest way it won't work um, because these people have got these areas they're serious about it and um, they are very serious and to cross them you know you will you will come up for attack um, I had my tires slashed um, in that area um, quite a few times five six times and in the end, we had to move away and move to a different area. Well, my son does still go to school in that area. And it was painful. Can I say that it wasn't teenagers doing that? No, I can't. But I think when I met Gail for the coffee, she tipped me off. She said, you've upset a community. You've attacked a community. We're a very tight community. Um, Tarquin is a very popular child, and you called him a bully and there is a price to pay for that. And I think I did feel it. Um, my son was left out of the parties and I, my car was um, slashed. It might have been a troll I had. I mean, you can't really say they did that, but it, it was uncomfortable. Um, but it's a great testament to my son that he's gone through that. But I would and come out, you know, as um, someone that has friends, someone that has, has found working class friends um but what's wrong with that and actually it's um let me appreciate my own class and maybe those that are born into being working class should stay in working class but you kind of want your child to have the best and then you think to yourself if you achieve a certain standard in life like i'd achieved um working for fleet street and i'm not really proud of working for the news of the world but i am proud that I got my byline in the Sunday Times um, on the front page a few times and that I became a good journalist and I've done good stories, um, not just the tabloids and, and, you know, good stuff for the broadsheets and I, I have had people say that I am good and um, I have published books and become a Sunday Times best-selling author. So I have made achievements and I did think of myself in a certain way but obviously society and obviously certain um person that exists in society um doesn't see me as one of them i actually had a friend um around that time that i don't see very much um a girl called susie and she said oh i went to henley the other week she said and i met women like you were describing those school gate mothers are like and she said wow they are so powerful and that's how you kind of wrap it up really that um women there are certain women um, that create a power around being a wife, create a power of having um, a husband that has done well and that's, you've got the mansion, you've got the um, husband that, that's, that's done well. And, but 
they need to create something else because grabbing these schools and making them clicky and pushing out other women, it's not really right. You know, you've achieved what you have. It's an achievement. You've netted someone important and that has made you important and your status has grown. And the, uh, another woman over there hasn't been as lucky to have done what you've done. It doesn't mean they're a bad person. It doesn't mean their child is dirty. It doesn't mean um, that kind of thing. I mean, people do go on about race and, you know, the Muslims now are saying, well, we're left out of things and, you know, white privilege, but it's actually middle class privilege. There, there are, you know, there's the white working classes that are absolutely forgotten, so forgotten in so many ways. And our children are forgotten. Our children are forgotten in the school system. They, I mean, they really are. And they're really pushed out and they, you know, it's, um, it's horrible. And I have fought for my son to stay at a good school and I have had to fight and I'm quite proud that I have because I'm quite exhausted by it and I think that I started off somebody that couldn't really speak to women, that didn't know how to speak to women, that didn't really know where women were at and what they wanted and they seemed like strange creatures because I'd spent so much of my life um, having men as friends really and understanding where men came from and I understood what it's like to want to achieve a lot in your career but I didn't really understand what it was like to be a wife um, and to be that kind of woman so they seemed like really strange um, creatures and I don't know some part of me really envy them I mean I kind of myself would like to be really really protected by someone and really really um, put up in a big house and really given lots of money and not have to worry about everything and just wake up and be able to focus on my um, children and it was all because I was walking out the road with Jamie who lived on the corner um, where I lived in a mansion and has a pilot husband and she said oh I'm going to go and um, go back to work and I'm going to um, retrain and I'm a midwife and I, I don't I don't want to be a sad stay-at-home pilot's wife and um, I said to her that is it's incredibly glamorous thing and there's women everywhere that would love to be a stay-at-home um, pilot's wife so maybe those women that are being like they are are unhappy and you know they want the best for their children I suppose and if they think somebody hasn't got it together and they think oh that woman over there hasn't got it, her shit together she didn't bother to get married she's kind of screw up and she's flaky and her son will be flaky and I don't want my son hanging around with um, that boy because that boy is going to be a flake um, I suppose in some kind of way you can't blame them um, I after all moved to that area I didn't want to stay in a working class area I didn't want my son talking like eh, um or being a milkman <laughs> for a living so I suppose in a way they are me and I am them and in my experience with them I saw a reflection of myself and my own snobbery and where my own snobbery would take me which is to living in an area that um, wasn't really very loving but it was quite a lonely area and um, actually had a neighbour who came from New Zealand who moved and I said oh why are you moving? Well, I'm lonely here, it's a lonely area, nobody speaks to each other, and it wasn't super friendly. And I have a friend who's in their 70s and got a son, and the son is um, 25 now, and he's still living at home. And she moved to that area, and you know, she was single, and um, she never met a man, she never remarried, and uh. And it's because, you know, you move to those areas, she's not a blue stocking woman. And, you know, those men, they're looking for a certain caliber, as they put it, of wife. So she wanted to do better for herself, but ended up just merely isolating herself and isolating her son, really, at the same time, although she loves him to bits. And I didn't want to do that to my son, which is why I moved out of the area and I'm living in a working class area. Um, everyone but me is black, but um, it's better in a way. I feel somehow less less hated and less judged, and it's odd because I used to cart myself around in 
a tracky bottoms and not bother with makeup. But now all of a sudden I'm away from women that do that. I dress up and wear, you know, business suits. And um, I suppose I learned from them and maybe they could learn from me. I think partly they were jealous of the fact I had a job that was quite exciting and they felt that what they had got was the top of the tree and then when they heard me like on the phone to Jude Law or something they thought well she's got more and maybe that's why they um, wanted me to go away. Um, it was interesting that with Gail I had a picnic with her and I bought my <laughs> my power animal cards and I said because I thought oh god I'm not gonna um be able to sit and talk about house furnishings and girly stuff and I thought I know I'll and actually this woman's not like that she's a very talented um photographer and um she um so I bought my power animal cards and I said I'm oh can I find your power animal and she said, what's that? And I said, well, I'll just lay out some cards. I laid out all my power animal cards and I said, pick three animals that you like. So she picked, um, I think it was a lizard and a lion and a horse. And I lined them up in a row and I said, the lion is who you really want to be. You really want to be a really, really strong, fierce woman and a fantastic mother but you can't get there because that, the horse is stopping you and um, the lizard is how you're feeling because you're feeling bad because you can't be the lion because um, of the connecting card which is the horse and um, she said well how do you mean and I said oh god I'm even giving this woman a little reading and I said um, well the connection card I said you need to connect with Horses. I know it sounds mad, but you need to go and get a book on horses, go and, I don't know, go and get a picture of a poster of a horse, go and get a necklace of a horse, go and be with a horse. I said, and then for some reason, when you do that, then you will be able to um, finally get where you want to be, um, which is um, a fire in your belly, really, the lion. You know, the lion is, so it has a fire in their belly and it's yellow, so it's associated with the uh, the solar plexus where the self-esteem is so um the sun power of the sun so um to be a whole woman to be a full woman to be self-actualized so um anyway she went off and i thought oh no gosh she thinks i'm a nutter and then i saw her the other morning and she said to me well actually maybe you're right maybe i should connect with a horse and i was yeah 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 you should you should she said, she said uh because when i was 16 she goes i was um a famous show jumper I'm like what? And she said, "Yeah, I, I won cups, and I, I was really good at it. And it, horses all my life. You believe it?" She, she held back on that, and I'm like, "You're kidding?" She said, "No, no, no." And she said, um, "Her mother wasn't interested. Her father was a colonel. You believe that? And her grandfather was a general. And um, so she's a fascinating woman. And um, she had done that, and because her mother hadn't had an interest in her, she totally cut off from that part of her. So she had." A kind of a um, young girl inside it had kind of been frozen off and she kind of just shut her and killed her dead really and she put away all her cups and didn't even show them to her children and put away all these pictures of her doing this amazing thing like a show jumper it's something absolutely fantastic um so it's interesting you know people that we think have got it all they've got pain inside them too and you know they just want the best for their kids too so perhaps you know it's not down to a load of women scrabbling around and um what in the best for their children and pushing and shoving and you know leaving out other kids and being just generally awful um like big girls really um so trillions girls then maybe it's up to the schools to be mature and um to take half of this person half of that you know uh, and to not let it affect them and actually there is a brilliant school um called st stephen's and it's a school in the middle it doesn't have any of that going on no snobbery no pushing people out and going to and it's just fantastic and it's run by um a welsh woman <laughs> it's just this welsh don't you just know it that 
the Welsh don't have any of that nonsense. And it was an amazing school and I was lucky that my son um, spent time there. So I want to um, really share, and I don't know if I've been cut off or whether I've managed to be on air um, with the other host um, interrupting and um, sending me rude messages. Um, one of them says, of course, you're not middle class, you're dirt class. <laughs> oh, what the? Hmm, lovely messages. <laughs> um, um, I need to get my self-esteem up. Actually, I should learn from those women that they had just this amazing self-esteem. And, you know, we can get what we want in life, but we have to love ourselves first. And we have to, if people treat us badly, we have to say, no, nope, no, nope, not coming in that door. Um, because once you allow people to treat you badly, then you just start saying yourself that you're not worth it. And I, I had an amazing lunch today with a really nice girl um, in Peacheton Nurseries actually, um, a really nice girl who I met when she was researching for Nick Davies of The Guardian and she was doing something on the phone hacking for um, I think Channel 4 and so she bought me dinner today and she said she was reading my book and how she loved it and how I'd been so amazing and I said I'm not amazing I'm a screw up I've got no money and you know I don't own my own house and she was like how can you think that of yourself and um, I thought yeah it's it's nice you know we should all of us surround ourselves with people that think massively you know good of us and if anybody criticizes us or puts us down I'm um, just to you know push them out the door it's not right to have people in our lives that name call us, that criticize us, that say A, B, C, D. You know, I used to, part of me thought, oh, I need that, you know, I need someone to correct me, which is absolutely, you know, I'm so old right now, um, I don't need people like that. And only when you don't have people like that, and you do have people like um, the lovely lady I spent the afternoon with, who say nice things to you, and you go away thinking, yeah, I feel good. I mean, they just feel good to you but I went away feeling like really really good I went away feeling um, clean inside because I spent time with somebody who um, reflected me actually how I was and reflected um, truth and it made me good rather than being around people but either being sneaky and not being um, direct with you or trying to manipulate you um, all week I've had that and um, all people that are abusive because of their own um, narcissistic personality disorders or whatever they've got wrong with them that they have to abuse others to um, get by in life um, that you have to get rid of them you have to you only have one life and one thing I learned from the women of St Margaret's is they walked tall they did walk tall and their men in life might not have been good looking but they all treated them softly treated them tenderly gave them things, gave them, um, you know, whatever they could, I suppose. Um, just, you know, I mean, it was a bunch of flowers. It's a sort of beautiful um, thing to have, but they treated them just um, softly. And, you know, those women knew their own value and they treated themselves um, softly and with love. And that's all we can do. And that's all we can do to our children, um, you know, my son knows the world isn't perfect. I had fantasies when I was younger that he would not know pain and I wanted to get him to about 16, 17 without knowing any pain, with thinking the world was like, you know, a good place and that, you know, but he doesn't and he's been bullied and he knows that um, sometimes heads of schools can be corrupt and he knows some heads of schools can be really, really kind, like the Welsh um, lady that he um, was lucky enough to have mentoring him so he now has a balanced view of the world and it's made him a lot stronger so anybody who's going through that his child has been bullied um don't despair sometimes it's just like a bit of a flu shot that if they get that when they're children they can go out in the world go to an office and there is somebody there who's nasty to them but they can stand up for themselves they can just think oh well that was like, you know, uh, something that I went through when I was at school, I didn't know how to deal with it. So it's not really the end of the world, and we can learn and grow from it. I mean, it's quite hard to know when your child's been bullied to know what to do and 
I've heard horrible stories about um, one woman who went round their house, the parents' house of the child, and next thing the parents said, oh, I'm, you know, I'm suing you, and <laughs> they sued her, and, you know, there's awful horror stories, and when you're going through it, you can't really, you know, it sounds easy, it sounds, well, just move your school, move your kid to another school, but, you know, then you think to yourself, well, will that happen at the other school, and it's the most awful thing, and I'm so glad that my son's a teenager and out of that kiddie winky um, thing because it is a lot of pressure on the parent and my advice um, to anyone listening anyone interested if they stay with me this far thank you very much um, that network and you know when you do go to the school gate do make friends be really really super friendly do make friends do um, go to the coffee mornings, which is so important to go to those coffee mornings. Do go to any of the parties. Just just turn up and don't leave early like I did. Stay, keep it through because it's beneficial for your child and your child will thrive if you put the time in and do that, even if you just grit your teeth or, I don't know, have a big glass of wine before you go so you can tolerate it. Um, do go. And there will be women there that you do get on with. And it is stressful and it's best really to practice, you know, I mean... I do know other people now that say to me, oh, yeah, women are hard, aren't they? I don't really bother with it much. But, you know, we do need women. Women need other women. And often people that need them the most are the ones that stay away from them and avoid them and isolate and, you know, say, well, I don't need them. But you do need them. You're just scared of them. And you're scared of the world you've left behind. But you need to get the guts to go back and join it. And there will be women that will reject you, but there'll be some that won't reject you. And there'll be some that you fall out with, and there'll be some that you'll carry on speaking with. But you really have to get into that world. And actually, it can be painful. It does trigger pain, but there are antidotes to that pain. There's the back flower that you can take. You can take one for confidence. You can take one for pain. You can make sure all the uh, pain body that you've got going through your body is out. I mean, I... All this week I've been talking to my son's head about possibly moving schools because um, we're so far out, we're so far away. <laughs> I'm in the country and it's just awesome. Um, simple folk and um, it's nice. There's no keep, keep, keeping up with the Joneses, but they're like, mm, well, you're a few minutes late. Well, you should maybe move them to a school out there. And it maybe it triggered the memory of my mother who um, screwed up my education. I thought, hang on. It's another woman coming in, but they're screwing up my son's education, trying to push him out of the school because get someone, another kid in there, rich kid in there. I know there's a waiting list. And it annoyed me because I thought, hang on, lovey, this is child. This is his education. This is his future. And you're trying to um, just kind of screw with it in some kind of way. And it upset me and it angered me. And I've sorted it out by straight talking. I said to her, I think that this is what you want to do. It is making me feel really bad. And she said, I assure you, I'm not doing that. Whether she's lying or not, I don't know, but I have to accept her at face value. And um, I went off and I felt so stressed and I felt so much pain in my body. And it was the memory of my mother coming up about how she, you know, ruined my education. And it's, a great, it's so important an education because you know, it's what job you do. Are you going to be struggling or are you going to go straight into a swanky job? And people say degrees don't matter, but you really do need it. You need everything you can get. You know, you need good teeth. You need a good speaking voice. Anything you can get these days because there's such a crowded little island. And of course, I want my son to have his little passport of a degree. And um, so I don't want anybody screwing up his education and I thought this woman was doing it and she was quite rabid coming at me and I haven't slept um, because I've been so upset and um, it's triggered memory of my mother and I my body has been my body where it stores the memories um, has been in pain so I'm gonna look to try and find a way of getting stored memory actually out of this body I've done primal therapy, which clears the emotional body, but actually you can have stored memories in the physical body, which um, there must be a way of getting it out. So if anybody knows a way, please do comment below the video um, if you have stayed with me for this long. Thank you. It's been a really bumpy ride because um, I had um, a trial um, attacking me during um, 
in the guise of one of the other hosts which um and name calling so it's hard to remember what you're doing if somebody is abusing you or you're um on air and calling you various um nasty things like low class and um i think white nigger was um one of the insults which um was um typed to me so that wasn't very nice um so i think we're coming to the end of the show um yeah i've got six minutes i don't even know whether i've got the air um i hope i've got the air i'll know if i've got the air uh because i will hear the music but i've had to cut off quite a few um times i hope my producer will be able to um piece the show together so it doesn't have any bumps in it and i hope overall that i have spent this time productively and managed to help um, anybody looking for um, looking for help and as I said I will ha hang the GMTV um, video as part two um, part two in this and I will call it um, Schoolgate Mothers or something to that effect so just punt down the um, part two you can see my appearance on GMTV and I'll write something below it um, I hope it's helped you and I hope it helps you realize that sometimes picking a school for your child isn't as easy as you might think um yeah and um i've got five minutes to go so um you can reach me on facebook chris joe hart i'm on facebook um i think i have reached the maximum number of friends but please do click follow me i mostly leave my posts on public um please subscribe to me below i haven't got many subscribers as you can see so please show me up by hitting subscribe even if you don't want to see the rest of my videos um i will have a guest next week so i do have shows every week on revolution radio thursday seven o'clock uk time but of course um it goes out across america and that is a different time it's in the afternoon um so i hope everything's fine over there in america um it's a beautiful country you don't have class systems so to a certain extent i see it as a free land um it's a beautiful place and i had the i was lucky enough to live there for like years thank you so much thank you That's your cerebral cortex looking for an answer it doesn't have. See? Even your brain knows you're screwed. The blood is filling with adrenaline right now. Whether you know it or not, your heart's beating fast. It's getting a little harder to breathe. The neurobiological system is telling it to run. But your knees are too weak to move. Fear is not real. The only place that fear can exist is in our thoughts of the future. It is a product of our imagination, causing us to fear things that do not at present and may not ever exist. That is near insanity. But do not misunderstand me. Danger is very real, but fear is a choice. We are all telling ourselves a story. Listening to 
Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. 100% listener supported radio. Reporting the danger. Unafraid. Right here, where information never sleeps. Revolution. Revolution. Radio. safe? Do you have the necessary information to assist you in confidently living through just about any survival situation? Is survival and gardening, off-grid living, medical knowledge, or even natural or man-made EMPs on your list of personal concerns? Do you have your documents and your personal information in a safe place in your hands where you know where it is? Well, check out our preloaded EMP-proof thumb drive. Over 3 gigs of survival documents and how-tos, plus the USDA offline food preservation website, and much, much more, including a surprise bonus we just can't tell you about here. With plenty of room left over to store your most important...